Chapter 17 The Sociobiology Wars At the outset, Harvard's Edward O. Wilson, the world's leading expert on ants, was the villain. In 1975, he published the book that started the war, Sociobiology, The New Synthesis, with sociobiology defined as the systematic study of the biological basis of all social behavior. His early chapters dealing with insects were well received, but the final chapter on human behavior ignited the most tumultuous academic controversy of the 1970s, as Wilson himself wrote. Boyce Rensberger wrote a page one article for the New York Times headlined, Updating Darwin on Behavior. Earlier, insect societies were seen as evidence for the remarkable variety of nature, Rensberger wrote. But now there was something new. Beneath that variety were common behavioral patterns governed by the genes and shaped by Darwinian evolution. Behavior governed by the genes. That was the contentious issue. In 1963, the geneticist Theodosius Dobshensky had summarized the older view. Culture is not inherited through genes. It is acquired by learning from other human beings. But Wilson's sociobiology tended to put the genes back in charge. One might say that he revived the old nature versus nurture debate. Richard Dawkins was one of many biologists who at first agreed with Wilson, but the storyline kept changing, and Dawkins took offense when Wilson sharply dissented from Dawkins's book, The Selfish Gene. Wilson also accused Dawkins of being a journalist, but all that came later. Wilson as Philosopher and Naturalist Wilson once called himself a Roosevelt liberal turned pragmatic centrist. He grew up as a Baptist in Alabama and read the Bible through twice. Then, after studying science, he lost his faith. But unlike others in that position, he had no desire to purge religious feelings. So he tried to fortify the bleak philosophy of materialism by rethinking it as a consilient whole. Preferring a search for objective reality over revelation is another way of satisfying religious hunger, he wrote. He presented his dream of a unifying theory in Consilience, 1998. Ever wider fields of knowledge were united in single Ionian enchantment. Everything can be reduced to the laws of physics. Everything evolved. Mind is matter. One day I went to see Wilson at his Harvard office. He showed me the ants patrolling about behind clear glass without paying us any mind. He talked most interestingly about them for an hour or more. Ants come in maybe 12,000 species, but there may be twice that number. The vast majority have never been studied by anyone. Ants are rarely fossilized, but sometimes they are trapped in amber. What did ants evolve from? We don't know, but wasps are one possibility. Like many other visitors, I left wanting to know more. When he is describing his ants, discovering their pheromones or writing about olfactory communication among animals, Wilson is being what he calls himself, a naturalist and an impressive one. But consilience, in which everything is interconnected, was questionable. It was fluid enough that almost anything under the sun could be explained. Genes versus Instincts In the pre-gene decades, animal behavior was often attributed to instinct. In The Origin, Darwin attributed to the hive bee making its cells an instinct so wonderful that some might see it as sufficient to overthrow my whole theory. Later, however, instinct fell out of favor as an explanatory term. It glossed over mechanisms that are not remotely understood. The history of science has often shown this tendency. A new concept creates the illusion of explanation for a while. Then it wears thin, and philosophers must invent something new. So instinct was replaced by genes, thought of as the material cause of a vast range of human traits and maladies. The powers imputed to genes reached a peak with the decoding of the human genome at the turn of the new century. 
gene-driven animals did whatever was needed to find food, avoid predators, make nests, reproduce, and so on. They didn't have to learn, only obey, as Wilson put it. Ants are hardwired. Once born, they march off and do their thing without trial or error. When Conrad Lorenz allowed that all these marbles must have developed through material evolution by natural selection, the youthful Wilson was well pleased. He secured my allegiance. Ideological Conflicts It's worth noting that the sociobiology conflict divided scientists whose shared beliefs were otherwise quite fundamental. Those who quarreled over sociobiology all accepted materialism as a given. Mind and consciousness emerged from matter. And for all parties to the dispute, reliance on a creator or an intelligent agent was excluded ab initio. Yet despite these agreements, sociobiology pitted scientist against scientist. One might think that an expanded version of Darwinism that explained the behavior of both humans and ants in materialistic terms would win the universal acclaim of materialists and would offend only the religious. Yet the cry of indignation against genetically induced human behavior arose not from Christians, few of whom noticed, but from a handful of leftists, mostly based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. A well-known opponent was Richard Lewinton, like Wilson, born in 1929, whose office was one floor below Wilson's. Paradoxically, Wilson the naturalist was on the side of the genes, while Lewinton the geneticist was on the side of culture, to oversimplify. His best known ally was Stephen Jay Gould, 1941 to 2002. For the left, the argument framed in terms of genes was too deterministic. How could a new society appear if our tiny masters, that is, our genes, held us, as Wilson said, on a leash? Such a vision could only discourage revolutionary change. So the study group of science for the people led a counterattack. The left's critique was often irresponsible, its wild accusations contrasting sharply with Wilson's moderate views. The low point came in 1978, at a meeting in Washington, a protester dumped a jug of water over Wilson's head while others denounced his supposed encouragement of genocide and racism. Even as ice cubes were sliding down his back, Wilson had the presence of mind to note that Garland Allen, a science historian in the audience, had taken the floor to say why the attack had been justified. He said it was all of a piece, Wilson recalled. Since the 19th century, there had been a strong bias toward genetic determinism, the claim being that human beings are fixed in their destiny by their genes. Therefore, there was nothing we could do about it. Therefore, the existing order is the best possible order, validating the ruling class in their position. It was all a part of the continuing conspiracy by scientists in the ruling class. The left was just as extreme on paper. Co-signers of a statement in the New York Review of Books dismissed Wilson's book as an attempt to revive theories which had provided an important basis for the enactment of sterilization laws and eugenics policies which led to the establishment of gas chambers in Nazi Germany. By the time Wilson deplored this ugly, irresponsible, and totally false accusation, he had the vast majority of scientists on his side. Nowhere had he said that human behavior is determined by the genes. In rough terms, Wilson said, I see maybe 10% of human behavior as genetic and 90% as environmental. But such statements don't get us far if the effective cause, whether genetic or environmental, can only be established by observing the resulting behavior. If one thing happens, the genes dominate. If another, it's the environment. No outcome can falsify the theory. Meanwhile, the genes that are said to cause the behavior, or to cause it sometimes, have not been identified in a single instance. Lewinton and his allies did make such criticisms, but the science was often buried beneath comments so ill-advised that the New York Times, normally sympathetic to left-wing opinion, didn't hesitate to take Wilson's side. Hamilton's Contribution 
A key contribution to sociobiology was made by the evolutionary biologist William D. Hamilton. He would migrate from his chilly graduate student digs to the somewhat warmer waiting room at Waterloo Railway Station, where he was rewarded with a key insight. Darwin's theory had implied that natural selection would generate a selfish world. It was the fittest that survived, after all. Yet, undeniably, there was a lot of altruism out there. Hamilton's explanation, published in 1964, took time to sink in. But once it did, the evolutionists sang their hosannas. Kin selection, of course. A particular gene exists not just in one organism, Hamilton argued, but also in others, closely related. Siblings share half their genes, first cousins one-eighth of theirs, and so on. These ratios were not arrived at by comparing actual DNA sequences, but deduced mathematically. Therefore, Hamilton argued, an action that endangers an individual, but promotes the survival of more than two siblings, or more than eight first cousins, would be advantageous. It would promote the spread of the gene that triggered the seemingly ill-advised behavior. Hamilton's argument became central to Dawkins's The Selfish Gene, 1976, a book intended to examine the biology of selfishness and altruism. Wilson also embraced kin selection. Darwinism was now shown to be consistent with altruism by taking this more inclusive view of fitness. The sociobiologist Robert Trivers wanted to expand the analysis to more distantly related animals, positing genes for reciprocal altruism. That was thought less successful, but with the costs and benefits appropriately assigned, it could be invested with an air of plausibility. While at Harvard, Trivers instructed Huey Newton in jail and even joined the Black Panthers. MIT's Steven Pinker called Trivers one of the great thinkers in the history of Western thought. Hamilton's kin selection theory published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, was highly mathematical. But that was one of its triumphs. It seemed so obscure, yet also up-to-date. When Hamilton, 1936 to 2000, died of malaria in the course of a research expedition to Africa, his funeral oration in the chapel of New College, Oxford, was delivered by the atheist Dawkins. Those of us who wish we had met Charles Darwin can console ourselves. Dawkins began his eulogy, we met W.D. Hamilton. Hamilton, Wilson, Dawkins and company had scored a great victory. Henceforth, if you wanted to explain anything, whether physical or behavioral, you could assert that there were genes for those qualities. Darwinism could then be invoked to say that natural selection had acted on those genes. After all the rancor and theatrics, that seemed sufficiently scientific. In due course, genes were supplemented by other units of selection. Memes, replicators of cultural behavior, invented by Dawkins, and modules, traits evolving independently, the notion of Pinker. Probably, Pinker wrote in How the Mind Works, 1997, modules look like roadkill sprawling messily over the bulges and crevasses of the brain. A recalcitrant Lewinton said in one of his essays, that we still hadn't found the genes for skin color. We still haven't, but their existence is assumed because the trait is hereditary. Furthermore, you didn't have to know anything about the environment in which a given gene was said to have been selected. You could make up your own story. Lewinton and Gould dismissed such scenarios as just-so stories. How did the leopard get its spots, for example? Well, one leopard accidentally had a spots mutation call it a gene from now on. And it survived better because camouflage helped. So spotted leopards survived better than plain vanilla ones and eventually displaced them. So that was how the leopard got its spots. The same argument could be applied to any trait, whether animal or human. The method consists essentially of contemplating the trait and then making an imaginative reconstruction of human history that would have made the trait adaptive Lewinton and his co-authors wrote in Not in Our Genes, 1984. A related problem arose with kin selection. 
In a plain language section of his famous article, William Hamilton wrote, the alarm call of a bird probably involves a small extra risk to the individual making it by rendering it more noticeable to the approaching predator. But the consequent reduction of risk to a nearby bird previously unaware of danger must be much greater. The relevant costs and benefits are never actually measured, notice. In fact, there is no way of measuring them other than by observing the behavior they are said to shape. The fact that one bird emits the alarm call itself demonstrates, to Hamilton's satisfaction, that the benefits, to the species, must exceed the costs. The problem is that the theory never gets off the page and into the real world. Explanatory Power of Sociobiology Sociobiology purported to explain many aspects of human behavior including territoriality, entrepreneurship, faith, xenophobia, aggression, and warfare. Later, in deference to the fact of altruism, sympathy, kindness, and selflessness were added. Some behavior does seem ill-suited to the theory. Masturbation, adoption, homosexuality, contraception, and celibacy of the clergy. Another argument was that evolution happened eons ago, so that we are adapted to the Stone Age. Genes evolved in one environment, and we live in another. This gives sociobiology a defense against facts that don't fit. If the facts correspond to a given adaptation story, the theory is confirmed. If not, it's because the environment is now different. Robert Wright said in The Moral Animal, 1994, that Darwinian selection had reached a point where one no longer entertains the possibility of encountering some fact that would call the whole theory into question. But a field that smoothly explains whatever exists is no longer a part of science. As Karl Popper said, irrefutability is not a virtue of a theory, as people often think, but a vice. Omitted from the sociobiologist's categories was the faculty of reason, Stephen Jay Gould drew attention to this shortcoming when he criticized the claim that Eskimo behavior validates altruist genes. When food is scarce and an Eskimo family must move, grandparents sometimes stay behind to die rather than slow down the entire family. But altruistic genes are redundant, Gould pointed out. Elderly Eskimos can figure it out for themselves and have an incentive to stay behind in families where sacrifice is celebrated in song and story aged grandparents who stay behind become the greatest heroes of the clan. Once reason is admitted as a human characteristic, and in truth it may be the most important characteristic of all, it can be shown to preempt many, or perhaps all, so-called behavioral genes. Nonetheless, in the biology departments at least, the debate was won by Wilson and allies. The claim that sociobiology would take over the field of sociology was not borne out, but it had some success in psychology, where it advanced under the rubric of evolutionary psychology. Enter EvoPsych. The seminal work of evolutionary psychology was The Adapted Mind, 1992, edited by the husband and wife team from UC Santa Barbara, Lida Cosmides and John Tooby. A prominent addition to the evolutionary psychology genre was A Natural History of Rape, The Biological Basis of Sexual Coercion, 2000, by Randy Thornhill and Craig Palmer. In 1975, it's safe to say, Cambridge collectives would have been on the march at the mere suggestion of a book about rape-specific adaptations. The authors had wisely skirted the gene word, but by then the field was so lax that almost anything was waved through. Adaptations are vaguely said to be in bodies, but Thornhill and Palmer never said where. How would they locate them? Explaining something by saying that unidentified genes for it exist and were selected for is little more than a reassertion of the facts whose explanation we are seeking. Analogously, if the stock market drops, investors looking for an explanation may find the headline, Selling Pressure Causes Stocks to Drop. But that doesn't help. 
it merely redescribes the phenomenon. Unobserved genes for behavior have the same defect. In a critical review of the Rape book, the loyal Darwinian Jerry Coyne pointed out in The New Republic that the author's evidence is so adverse to their thesis that it is consistent with a more obvious hypothesis, that rape is not adaptive at all. As with most sociobiological arguments, he added, only some level of concordance with prediction need be found to brand an act as an adaptation. Some rapes do cause pregnancy, in other words. Coyne was right, but the critics of evolutionary psychology were disarmed by the materialist worldview they shared with their opponents. As Thornhill and Palmer wrote, when one considers any feature of living things, whether evolution applies is never a question. The only legitimate question is how to apply evolutionary principles. For good materialists, Darwinian processes must explain everything. When sociobiology is seen in a political light, the leftist animus against it is understandable. Sociobiology explains, in a very weak sense of that word, whatever exists. Existing qualities of human nature are accounted for by the usual unfalsifiable formula. The trait first arose by accident, then it was selected for. But as Marx said, socialists want to change the world, not explain it. The world that exists must be replaced by something better. A world without inequality, for example. The raison d'etre of the left is to champion states that do not exist. The sociobiologists retort that these things don't exist either because the requisite genes aren't there or were not selected for, put the left on the defensive. The whole field of sociobiology suffers from this defect, and in that sense, it really does have a conservative bias. Fashionable for a while, evo-psych in due course faded, and today it is rarely discussed. Wilson's Latter-day Rebellion A surprising twist to the story came in 2010, Along with two mathematicians from Harvard, Martin Nowak and Corina Tarnita, Wilson published an article in Nature, The Evolution of Eusociality. Its math was obscure, but its message was plain and unexpected. Now Wilson had given up on kin selection. He had replaced it with an updated form of group selection. Eusociality? Wilson and his pair of math helpers said it meant that some individuals reduce their own lifetime reproductive potential to raise the offspring of others who are not necessarily closely related. It was said to underlie the most advanced forms of social organization and the ecologically dominant role of social insects and humans. Dawkins called this development a poorly defined and incoherent view that evolution is driven by the differential survival of whole groups of organisms. Later, he said in Prospect magazine that Wilson's article had provoked very strong criticism from 137 evolutionary biologists, including a majority of the most distinguished workers in the field. That included Coyne, Pinker, Trivers, Cosmides, and Tooby all mentioned above. By then, Gould and Hamilton were dead, and Lewinton had retired to Vermont. Dawkins further complained of the patrician hauteur with which Wilson ignores the very serious drubbing his nature paper received. He doesn't even mention those many critics, not a single solitary sentence. Does he think his authority justifies going over the heads of experts and appealing directly to a popular audience? as if the professional controversy didn't exist, as if acceptance of his tiny minority view were a done deal? Wilson. The beautiful theory, kin selection, which he had earlier championed, never worked well anyway, and now it has collapsed. Dawkins. Yes, it did and does work, and no, it hasn't collapsed. For Wilson not to acknowledge that he speaks for himself against the great majority of his professional colleagues is... It pains me to say this of a lifelong hero, an act of wanton arrogance. Jerry Coyne on Wilson's new position. If you're a famous biologist, you can get away with publishing Drek. The war may not be over yet. Interviewed by the BBC in 2014, Wilson was asked to explain his contretemps with Dawkins. 
He replied, There is no dispute between me and Richard Dawkins, and there never has been. Because he's a journalist, and journalists are people that report what the scientists have found, and the arguments I've had have actually been with scientists doing research. In effect, Wilson had enraged Dawkins by questioning the basis of Dawkins's book, The Selfish Gene. By then, those old adversaries, Wilson and Lewinton, had almost become allies. Wilson relied on standard natural selection theory in the context of precise models of population structures. Somehow, it represented a simpler and superior approach. Yet, Wilson was candid enough to tell The New Yorker that he couldn't understand the all-important math contributed by his co-authors. Damaging the Darwinian Enterprise Philip Johnson of UC Berkeley pointed out that the critics of sociobiology had threatened Darwinism itself. Sociobiology's obviously pseudoscientific methodology had undermined the credibility of the whole Darwinian enterprise, Johnson said. Its critics may have burned down the Darwinist house in order to roast the sociobiological pig. The same critical scrutiny could have far-reaching consequences if it were applied to the generally accepted Darwinian theory. For Darwinism, too, claimed that complex adaptive organs came into existence through the accumulation of micro-mutations by natural selection. And, like sociobiology, it assumed that stories of adaptive evolution require no confirmation from genetics or paleontology or anything else except the adaptionist community's prevailing sense of plausibility. Some of Wilson's later books, and there were several, were praised by various environmentalists. Among them, Al Gore, Bill McKibben, and Jeffrey Sachs. In the Future of Life, 2002, one of Wilson's chapters was titled The Century of the Environment. By then, Wilson had emerged as a fashionable crusader for sustainable development, deploring human-caused species extinctions. We humans were too numerous, should change our destructive ways, and settle down before we wreck the planet. One has to hand it to Wilson. Having started out as the villain of the piece, he became the hero in the end. And today, we hear little more of sociobiology or evolutionary psychology.